bringing hope to many around the globe, transforming lives into legacy. Living Word with Pastor Mensah Otobu. And now, today's word. Today I'm speaking on built by the word. Built by the word. We're talking about building our faith. We're talking about building our Christian life. And we've talked about uh, several things about building. Today we are focusing on built by the word. And we're going to emphasize on the power of God's word to build us up. It's a very important message that I believe it's critical for our Christian growth as we follow the Lord. My text is from the book of Acts chapter 20 and from verse 28 to 32. Acts chapter 28, chapter 20, verse 28 to 22, uh, to 32, sorry. It's important to get a context uh, within which this message is occurring. And after uh, I read the text, I will give you the context and then we will do some work with the text. Acts 20, 28 to 32. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Now note verse 32. So now brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Amen. Now, this is the Apostle Paul speaking to the church in Ephesus. And if you just want some context uh, in terms of uh, uh, length of message, uh, there are recorded messages of the Apostle Paul. Uh, this and his message in Acts chapter 17 on Mars Hill would be probably the longest discourse that is recorded in the book of Acts for Paul. Uh, and he's speaking specifically to the church in Ephesus. And uh, he has lived in Ephesus for three years and has taught for three years in Ephesus and raised a church, a church that has been built on the foundation of Christ. And after three years, he is getting ready to leave Ephesus, to move on eventually, ending him in Jerusalem. And, and so he's given final instructions to this church that he has pastored for three years. And he says some very interesting things to the church. He says that when he leaves, a few things will happen. He says that there will be false preachers who will attack the flock. He likens them to wolves and the flock to sheep. And he also said that some people will rise in the church who will speak very perverse things and draw people after themselves and not after Christ. So it's not a very exciting send of party. It's not one of those parties where the man says, oh, we did a great job, and after I leave, everything will be cool. Uh, Paul is saying, when I leave you after these three years, the church will be in crisis because people will teach all kinds of false doctrines, and they will try to draw you away from Christ onto themselves. 
So how are the people supposed to deal with this crisis that Paul is talking about what happened to the church? And he tells them in verse 32, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up. In other words, there is going to be trouble when I leave, but I leave you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up. That's all he's saying. This is all you're going to need to deal with what is coming you're going to need the word of his grace everybody say the word of his grace i'll say it like you are in church this morning say the word of his grace all right now he didn't say i leave you uh, to a prayer and prayer is great but he that's not what he said he didn't say i leave you to some gifts of the spirit my they are great but that's not what he said he didn't even say i leave you to the word of his law which is important, but that's not what he said. He was very careful about what he was commending for them. He said the word of his grace. What is the word of his grace? The word of his grace is knowledge of God based on his grace. Knowledge of God based on his grace. It's very important. It is the kind of preaching that directs people to the grace of God and not to the power and eloquence of men. The word of God's grace focuses on God's grace and not the power or eloquence of men. In other words, Paul is saying after I leave you, some will come to draw people for themselves, they will point you to themselves. But the way to deal with it is to focus on the word of God's grace. The word of God's grace moves us from trusting in our own works to trusting in God. The word of God's grace takes our eyes from human effort to God's ability. The word of God's grace focuses us on God's sufficiency, not our efficiency. It is not so much about how anointed we are, but how much God is able. And so he says, the word of his grace is what I leave with you. I believe that same word of his grace is what God is leaving with us. How are we going to deal with all the things that come against our faith? The word of his grace. And then he said the word of his grace is able to build you up. Build you up. The word he uses uh, that is translated in English as build means to finish a structure for which a foundation has already been laid so when Paul says the word is going to build you up he's not talking about laying a foundation the foundation has already been laid but if you're going to survive if you're going to grow the word of his grace is what will come and build on the foundation Christ is the foundation but we are built by the word of his grace we are built by the word of his grace so Paul says two things about the word of his grace. First, it says the word of grace will build us up. And secondly, he says the word of his grace will give us an inheritance. The word of his grace will build us up. The word of his grace will give us an inheritance. This is Paul who describes himself as the wise master builder telling us how to be built up as Christians. And he says to be built up as Christians, you're going to need the word of his grace. There is so much preaching that is not the word of his grace. It is the word of condemnation. It is the word of criticism. 
It is the word of um, legalism. But the word of his grace is the word that tells you it's not so much about what you do, it's about what Christ has done. It's not so much about how powerful a man of God is, it is about how powerful God is. That is the word of his grace. It focuses on the grace of God and not the power of man. Anytime our eyes shift from the grace of God to the power of a man, we are departing from the word of grace. And yes, it may bring, uh, it may cause us to gather around people, but we will never be built up. The challenge of Christianity is that there are many followers of people but very few followers of Christ. We can quote what our pastor said, but not what Christ said. And as a matter of fact, for most people, if our pastor says something and Jesus says the opposite, we'll do what our pastor says and not what Jesus said. The church of Jesus Christ is no longer, in many instances, a church of Christ, it's a church of men. And we must get back to the foundation where we are built not by men, but by the word of his grace. He says the word of his grace will build you up. So how does the word of his grace build us up? How does it do that? If you want the word of God to build you up, how is the word of God going to build you up? And we're going to use a passage in Jeremiah that when God sent Jeremiah uh, on his mission, he gave him a three-step process by which the word of God builds. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9 to 10. Jeremiah 1, 9 to 10. And he reads, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I've put my words in your mouth. Verse 10. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and pull down, to destroy and throw down, to build and to plant. There is a three-level progression of how the word of God ends up building us. First, the word of God builds us by rooting out. It roots out. It removes what we have already built. To root out means to take out something from its roots. So when you want the word of God to build you up, it's not going to start by building you up. It's going to start by rooting out something in your life. Is going to remove something that has already been built. Jeremiah was instructed to use the word of God to pull things from the roots and pull them down from high places. So what does the word of God root out? The word of God roots out anything in us that is not the foundation of Christ. It roots out religious ideas that are not biblical. Because you know, over the process of life, we accumulate a lot of religious ideas that are not biblical. For example, people have heard of the very common phrase, heaven helps those who help themselves. I remember uh, before I was a pastor, I was working in an office and there was this man who liked quoting things. And so he says, you know, the Bible says heaven helps those who help themselves. I said, sir, he was my senior. I said, sir, it's not in the Bible. He says, it's in the Bible. I said, sir, it's not in the Bible. I read the Bible many times. It's not there. He says, you can't read the Bible from cover to cover. I said, I've done it many times. It's not in the Bible. He says, it's there. Because he's been convinced that 
that phrase is in the Bible. Heaven helps those who help themselves. In other words, for you to be helped by God, you have to help yourself. Now, if you have, can help yourself, why do you need God? Heaven helps those who cannot help themselves. That is what the scripture teaches. Whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is why we tell people to become Christian. They say, oh, I don't like the way my life is. I drink. Let me go and stop drinking. Let me stop uh, smoking. Let me stop uh, chasing women. Then I will come to church. And you want to help yourself before God helps you. If you can solve your problem, what do you need God for? We need God because we cannot help ourselves. That doesn't mean you don't make any human effort. But God does not help you because of your effort. He helps you because of his grace. It is called the word of his grace. When you are down, he lifts you up. When men give up on you, he gives you hope. When everybody says it's over, he says, I'm beginning with you. When you mess up, he forgives you. That is the Bible. He doesn't help you because you are a good person and you are trying your possible best. He helps you because his grace is sufficient for us and his strength is made perfect in our weakness. When we are weak, he is strong. So there are religious ideas people have. People sometimes believe that when you pray, your prayer goes up. That's why some people pray on top of buildings. It's good to be on top of a building to pray. But it doesn't shorten the distance between you and God. You know that. It's good to be on a mountain and pray. By all means, go and pray on a mountain. But the God who hears you on a mountain also hears you in the valley. The God who hears you at the 11th floor hears you in the basement also. He is no respecter of places. When we pray, our prayer doesn't go up because God doesn't live up. Remember when I was teaching that heaven is not a distance. It is a dimension. We live and move and have our, our being in him. He is saturated or we are saturated by his presence. He doesn't just live all around us. He acts for those who are believers. He lives inside of us. And the Bible says that he is able to answer our prayer according to the power that is at work in us. You may have a religious idea that your prayer must travel. But your prayer doesn't travel. He hears us when we pray. The word of God must root out religious ideas that are not biblical it must root out wrong cultural foundations that hinder the grace of God and there are quite a lot of it in this part of the world cultural foundations that hinder the grace of God and there are believers who have been born again and, and love Jesus Christ and love him but they still pour libation to ancestors and they'll say, Pastor, you know, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Now, if you're going to quote the scripture, you have to be contextual. You can't just quote the scripture by heart and apply it by heart to anything. Your ancestor is not Caesar, by the way. He's not Caesar. When Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, he's talking about giving to the state what is the state. And he limited himself to taxation. Not libation. You cannot appropriate a scripture to yourself just by that. But, but, but the Bible says, and then give it any interpretation. No, that's not how the Bible works. There are specific statements in the Bible for specific purpose. And you have to interpret it for the purpose for which it was meant. You cannot be a Christian and pour libation to ancestors. Whether it is a funeral or a child naming or whatever, you can people say, well, if you don't pour the libation, the coffin will not go. Please. <laughs> Where did you get that information from? A 
And remember, the person you are going to bury is not there. He's gone to two possible places. And really, he has no interest in what you are doing. What you are doing is for your own recognition of the value of a human being, but it has no interest in where the person will go. Nothing you do can determine where he goes. Where he goes is determined by himself whilst he was here on earth. If he receives Jesus Christ as Lord, he goes to heaven. If he doesn't, he goes to the other place. So the word of God must root it out. And for all of you who have funerals and so on and feel that where we have to obey tradition yes follow tradition but where tradition goes into a worship of something else other than jehovah god you have to stop it you have to stop it and the word of god must root out all of those things from us so our faith is not in in ancestors and gods and all kinds of things that we say is part of our tradition. The word of God must root it out. Then it says the word of God must destroy what it has root, rooted out. Why? Because it must demolish what is removed. Why? Because if that doesn't happen, we'll plant it again. Jesus said that when a demon has been cast out from a person, the demon will go and come back. And if the place is swept and nothing has been put in that place, he says that the demon will bring back other demons and the state of that person will be worse. So the word of God must root out, the word of God must demolish, and thirdly, the word of God must build. So that's what God is saying to Jeremiah. Uproot, destroy, build. You cannot build the word of God in your life until some things have been uprooted, destroyed, then the word can be built in us. And sometimes the reason why people go to church for a long time and there's no change is because the roots of a false belief are still there. You go to church, but your roots are wrong. And for all of you who think that Paul told Timothy to add a little water to uh, alcohol to water for the stomach's sake and use it as a cover if you are going to offer, follow the scripture, then take a glass of water and a drop of alcohol. If you are following, because he says water and then drop a little alcohol. Because he was talking about medicine. It was for medicinal purposes. Now, is your stomach hurting you? Are you sick? You say, Pastor, but this thing helps me. You sure it's helping you? Are you sick? Has the doctor recommended that for you? Is that a prescription? So when you go home and you pour yourself that glass of whiskey and you are drinking, I, what are you curing? <laughs> you know, somebody will say, I'm, I'm curing my confusion. <laughs> you sure you are curing confusion? Because you get more confused after drinking than before then. The scripture must be used for what it was meant. No scripture is for private interpretation. And the reason why sometimes we mess up in the scriptures is because sometimes you even find, unfortunately, clergymen who would teach this to defend their own lifestyles. You see, the Bible was not written by any one of us. And sometimes the truth in the Bible is hard on all of us. But you can't say because it's hard on you, you have to change it for yourself and make it easy. The word of God must uproot, it must destroy before it can build. If you are a pastor, it must still uproot. 
You can't say because I'm a pastor, oh, this word must be changed. The word must be made palatable. No, the word is it, not a friend to anybody. The word is the word all by itself. And it, if it must uproot something, it must uproot it. Now, if you don't have a stomachache and you are drinking raw alcohol without mixing it with a glass of water, you're not obeying even what Paul said. For your stomach's sake, not for confidence, not for boldness, not for peace of mind, not so you can sleep. Your stomach. What kind of stomach problem do you have, my friend? So the word of God will uproot. Everybody say uproot. Destroy. Build. The word of God, that's what it says. James chapter 1 verse 21 says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the engrafted word or implanted word which is able to save your soul. Lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the word of God. Until we let some things get out of the way, the word has no room in us. In the parable of the sower, Jesus talked about the seed that fell by the roadside. It's seed all right, but it was consumed. Talked about the seed that was on, in thorns. It was choked. The seed on the hard ground didn't find roots. It's possible to come to church for a long time and hear the word of God and enjoy it, but it has no place to be built because your roots, you are not allowing your roots to be uprooted. And believe you me, uprooting anything is hard. When you are uprooting a tree, it moves so much out of the way. Because roots go deep. But that's what the word must do. It must uproot. It must uproot. And for all of you who believe that Solomon married so many people and David, a man of his heart, God's heart married this, 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 this. Just because you can quote scripture doesn't mean you are theologically sound. Quoting scripture is not being scriptural. You can quote scripture all you want. Jesus was asked a similar question about multiple marriages and divorce. And Jesus says, in the beginning it was not so. That means that there is the ideal of God and there is the permissible of God. And the things in the Bible are not always for our example. Some are for our warning. So look at the effect of those people. Abraham and Hagar. Look at the problem. Go, go to Israel. Go to the West Bank. Sarah here, Hagar here, fighting from Abraham's time to today. Is that what you want? That after you are gone, your children are fighting, your grandchildren are fighting, your great-grandchildren are fighting and fighting, and, you, and your, your ancestors never have peace. Then go and follow it. It is there in the Bible, but it is for our warning. Solomon for our warning because after Solomon did that the Israelite kingdom was divided into two kingdoms and never got together again until 1948 when they returned piece by piece to their motherland one man's marriage destroys people for life so the word of God will uproot and if it is uprooting be humble don't fight it and say as for me as for me I don't agree I don't agree you, whether you agree or not the word of God is the word of God it doesn't need your permission to be the word of God it must uproot it must demolish and it must build and it is no respecter of titles 
And don't ever, don't ever look at a person and say, oh, oh, this is Pastor Tabel, he does it and so is right. No! Don't say, oh, that is Bishop so and so, he does it so is right. No! Don't say that, that is a prophet so and so, he does it so is right. No. What does God say? This is the foundation. And for all of us, the word of God comes against us to uproot, to destroy. So with the time left, let, let's look at some of the things the word of God must build. What must the word of God build in us? The word of God must build faith in us. The word of God builds faith in us. It is the first thing the word of God builds in our lives. Faith. Romans 10 verse 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. There are several kinds of faith. Faith is not the same. So let me go through a few of them. First is faith unto salvation. Faith unto salvation. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of your works is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Without faith, we cannot be born again. How does that faith for salvation come? It comes when we hear that we are sinners, that Jesus died for us, that when we have faith in him, our sins are forgiven. When we believe that, we have faith to be saved. And for those who believe that, salvation becomes their gift or God's gift to them. Then there is faith to please God. Faith to please God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5 and 6. By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is... And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Pleasing God is an act of faith, not of willpower. Living a holy life comes from hearing and believing the word that our righteousness is a gift from God through Christ. It is not a result of self-determination. If you're going to think, if you think, oh God, I want to live a holy life. So you squeeze your face as if you just drank a glass of lemon and, and you, you tell yourself, I, I'm not going to sin I won't sin, I won't sin before I realize you have sinned already and you are wondering what happened living a righteous life is not about self-determination it's not even about following rules, legalism living a righteous life and pleasing God is knowing that your righteousness is not of you. Your righteousness is of Christ. That he has made you righteous by his own grace. And you believe that. And you live it. The more you understand who you are the easier it is for you to be who you are. But if you don't know who you are, you cannot be who you are. Living a righteous life is not about going to hide from sin. Because sin has a way of finding you wherever you are hiding. It's not about following a dress code. I believe in dressing modestly. I believe we should dress modestly. I believe that men should dress modestly. Many times we, we put it on the women should dress modestly, but men dress anyhow and think it's modest. And I believe men should dress modestly. That means that you don't have to dress with the sole purpose of inciting or exciting a sexual desire in somebody else. You shouldn't do that. A man shouldn't do that, and a woman shouldn't do that. But you also know that no matter how you dress, People can feel something. A woman can dress like I am, wear a bada three piece, and a man will see him and have problems. And a man too can wear a bada three piece, and a woman will see him and have problems. So 
it's good to dress modestly, but really, it's not going to stop sin really that much. People who sin have a problem within them. Inside. It's not dress. Just accept it. It's not dress. People say, when you look at a woman's hair, hair, exoskeleton is giving you problems. It's not hair, my friend. You have something inside you that is warring against your members. That's what the scripture says. There is war. Something, there's a war going on inside you. So just stop blaming people and their dressing. And just start accepting. Even though I don't feel righteous, Christ has made me righteous. Even though I don't feel holy, he has made me holy. Even though I have conflict in my mind that is tending to be wrong thoughts, I have the mind of Christ. The more you believe it, the more you live it. Pleasing God is an act of faith, not willpower. I know people with willpower who have been overpowered. But it is trusting him one step at a time, day by day, to order your steps, to guide your thoughts. It's being sensitive to the Holy Spirit when he says, don't, you don't. When he says, don't say that, you don't say that. Don't go there, you don't go there. Don't sit there, you don't sit there. Because if you go and sit where he says you shouldn't sit, things will happen. Faith to receive from God. Hebrews Chapter 11, verse 11. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Sarah received strength to conceive. But the Bible says it was by faith. It was done by faith. She had the promise of God and she believed it. How did Sarah have faith to conceive? Well, she was in the tent with Abraham when they had some guests. Abraham went out to see the guests and they they had some talk and Abraham got Sarah to come and make some meal for these guests and he didn't know that one of them was the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord said to Abraham, tell your wife Sarah, Next year, about this time, she'll have a child. Sarah was in the tent and she heard it. And she laughed. Not laugh of disbelief, but it was a different kind of laugh. I don't want to get into that. Because she says to herself, how can these things be? We are all old people. And Sarah fully understood the process for producing children. It's not a kid. She's 90 years old, but she knows if children are going to be born, a few things must happen. And she says, these things don't happen these days. And so she's laughing and saying, hey, 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 hey. That's what's making her laugh. That's what's making her laugh. She said, hey, 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 me, hey, 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 Lord. But she knew that if she has to produce a child, faith without works is dead. So obviously, they had to obey the natural process. And she became pregnant. So the Bible is saying, by faith, Sarah received strength to conceive. That act of becoming pregnant was not willpower. It was because she had the promise of God. Next year about this time, you will have a child. And she acted in obedience to the word. And she had a child. So faith to receive from God simply means God says it. I believe it. And I act in accordance to the word. And it happens. How do we have faith? The word of God builds faith in us. Faith. 
to please God, faith to receive. Then we have faith to do exploits for God. Mark 11, 22 to 23. Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things he says will be done, he will have whatsoever he says. By faith we can move mountains. By faith we can turn hopeless situations around. And this faith comes by hearing and believing the word of God and speaking the word of God out of our mouth. This week allow the word of grace to build you up. And allow the word of grace to do exploits through your life. The word of grace also builds faith to fight to the end. Faith to fight to the end. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Faith to fight to the end. The Christian life is a permanent life. It starts on earth and ends in heaven. But for us to finish the journey, we're going to need faith to finish that journey. And that faith comes from the word of God. The word of God must build in us endurance to stay with Christ till the end. When we make a commitment to Jesus Christ, God is able to hold us because of the commitment. But we must also stand in faith that we do not fall away from faith, from following the Lord. Because my friends, there is a heaven. This earth is not our final destination. There is a place far better than this earth that God has prepared for his children and we must fight the good fight of faith and lay hold onto that eternal life and make sure that we make it to the end you must make it to the end you cannot just be a Christian for one year or born again for two years or for three years There are many who have fallen away from the faith. We pray that God will restore them. But you who are standing must stand to the end. And you must never compromise on your faith. Never give your your allegiance to idols. Don't ever take your trust from Jehovah God. Don't believe in any other savior except Jesus Christ. And stay faithful to him to the end. And that's what Paul was saying to the the church in Ephesus. The word of his grace will build you up. To build your faith. To stay to the end. That you will finish your course. And your race. That you will live a Christian Die a Christian, resurrect a Christian. Live for Christ, die for Christ, and be resurrected for Christ. That is our faith. And the word of God must build us. Now Paul is saying that in the process, people will come and deceive us. Sometimes it can be your own need. And believe you me, when, when, when you have problems, common sense doesn't work again. I know, I know, I know human need. If you're a woman, you've been married for a long time, you don't have a child, you're looking for a child. Desperation can lead you to do stuff. Things that you never thought you would do, places you never thought you would go, you would go. Things you never thought you would ever be made to do, you would do them. Things you not, never thought you would drink, you would drink them. People will pray for you who have no right to pray for you. But you are desperate. You need a child. And sometimes Christians go to rivers, river gods, 
Go to fetish priests. Go to all kinds of people. Your heart tells you the person is wrong, but your need is so strong. May God help you. That your desperation will not make you contaminate your faith. That you will remain faithful unto the end. It's important to have a child here on earth. But where we're going to spend eternity, the child you had here had no value there. We must be eternity minded. And if God blesses you with children, thank him for it. But don't ever compromise your faith for a child. Don't ever compromise your faith for health. Don't ever compromise your faith for wealth. Money is good. But don't compromise your faith for money. Listen to me. It's good to marry. As a pastor, we feel the frustration of our members. Maybe you never know. We feel your frustration. When you see church members going through difficulties like your own children going through difficulty. And you wish you can do whatever you can do to help them. So when you see people who want to get a husband, they don't have a husband. It, it is painful. But don't let the desire for a husband make you compromise your faith. You are a child of God. You belong to Jesus. Don't cheap in your body. Don't cheap in your life. Don't go and sleep with somebody just because you want to entrap them to marry you. You know the man, you know this guy is wrong for me, but I need to marry. I need to marry. God, I need to marry. Fight the good fight of faith. The early Christian, every Christian fights a fight. The early Christians, some of them were beheaded. Some were eaten by lions. Some were cut into two. Some were split and their stomach, intestines removed while they were alive for their children and wives to watch. Some were set on fire with coal tar around them. And whilst they were screaming, people were having parties. But none of them denied Christ. And they never thought Christ has abandoned them because their head has been cut off or because a lion ate their father. They still remain faithful to the end. In our time, all of us pay the price. For some of you, it may be a marriage challenge. It could be a, church, a child challenge. It could be a health challenge. It could be money challenge. It's not a lion eating you, but that is what you are also fighting for. Each one of us will suffer something for Christ. Each one of us will make a sacrifice for Christ. But the pointed thing is, we must be built so by the word of God that we fight the good fight of faith and we stay faithful to the end. No matter what the problem is. Maybe you didn't have your healing. Maybe you didn't have a husband. Maybe you didn't get a child. Maybe you didn't get any money. Maybe something didn't work for you. But you remain faithful to the end. So that your inheritance in Christ does not pass you by. And that's what Paul is saying to the church in Ephesus. After I depart, it's going to be hard. But I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which will build you up. And that is all I can say to you. I cannot solve all your problems for you. I, I, I desire, I wish I could help everybody solve their problem. I cannot. All I can say to you this morning, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among the saints. May the Lord keep you faithful. May the Lord keep you on track. May the Lord help you to fight to the end. May the Lord cause your faith never to fail. May your needs never take you away from Christ. May your desires never take you away from Christ. May Christ always remain number one in your life. In life or in death. May you live for Jesus Christ and for him alone. Amen and amen. God bless.
Amen. Thank you for listening to Living Word. To interact with Pastor Mensah Otebill, like his page on Facebook. Follow him on Twitter at Mensah Otebill. Email otebill at centralgospel.com or call plus 233-302-688-000.